Let me read to you a passage from the 15th chapter of St. John's Gospel, verses 26 to chapter 16, verse 4. It's the Gospel for Monday of the sixth week in Eastertide. St. John writes, Jesus said to his disciples, When the Counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you, so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this, so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. That's from John chapter 15, verse 26, to chapter 16, verse 4. And what does it suggest to us? Well, let us notice a pattern in the history of God's dealings with his people. I suppose we could say that in the Old Testament it was God the Father who spoke to Abraham and the patriarchs, to Moses and to the prophets. There is no formal revelation of the Holy Trinity, of course, and the prophets deal with God, the ultimate and the absolute. It is God the Father of his chosen people who reveals himself and has command of the scene. Then, in the fullness of time, he sent his Son, who was the image of the unseen God, the revelation of the Father, the face of the living God. Let all listen to him, the Father said to the three apostles from the cloud on the mountain. It is the Son who, as it were, took command of the scene and effected the work of the redemption by his teaching, his ministry, and above all by his death and resurrection. He constantly testified to the Father and gave glory to him. But we also observe the Son referring to the Holy Spirit, whom he says will soon come. You know, there is a danger, I think, of our thinking of the Holy Spirit as some kind of divine force or energy, a powerful grace, as it were, rather than as a living personal identity, a distinct person. The Holy Spirit is portrayed in the New Testament more as acting than as speaking, and because of this, his personhood might not strike us as forcefully as does that of the Father and especially the Son. But his divine personhood and his saving mission is clearly revealed nevertheless. He is most active in our Lord's life, leading him and giving power to his word and his work. Our Lord refers to him with, the, with profound reverence. If anyone blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, he said, he will not be forgiven. It is especially in the Gospel of St. John, and especially in our Lord's last discourses at the Last Supper, that the person, the character, and the mission of the Holy Spirit is revealed. He is the counsellor of Christ's disciples and of the Church. He is sent by Christ, and he comes from the Father, as did Christ himself. He ranks with Christ himself as a divine person, and his role will be to testify about Christ. We may say of the Holy Spirit that just as Christ testified to the Father, with the Father in his turn testifying to Christ, so the Holy Spirit will testify to Jesus, with Jesus in his turn testifying to him. He will testify about me, our Lord says in our Gospel, and you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. The great work of Christ's faithful, the church he founded on the rock of Peter, was about to begin. Its work would be to believe in him and to testify to him before the world as the one and only Saviour of mankind. The Holy Spirit would testify within the church as the church's heart and soul, animating and guiding the church in this great and constant mission. Just before he ascended into heaven, Christ gave to his disciples a charge. It was to go to the whole world and make disciples of all the nations. He would be with them to the end. But first, they were to await the promise of the Father, of which he had spoken. That was the Holy Spirit. And when he comes upon them, 
they would receive power. And with that power, they would be witnesses to him, to Jesus, both in Jerusalem and to the ends of the world. So the Holy Spirit is the great evangelizer within the church. He empowers the church to believe in Jesus and in all that he has taught. And he empowers the church to bear witness to Jesus to the ends of the, wor of, of the world. And including in the midst of persecution. So when Jesus has gone, the Holy Spirit takes command of the field as it were. Just as Jesus had had command of the field before him. All three divine persons, of course, are involved in the work at every point, from the call of Abraham to the end when Christ will come as judge. But when Christ goes, the Holy Spirit is given charge, and we see the results very soon. The church begins to expand, and persecution follows. Over three centuries of saints and martyrs, the church emerges as the religion of the empire. The empire falls under the barbarians from the north, and later is powerfully threatened by Islam from the east. But what do we see? Great council after council proclaim the faith of the church, and a new evangelization of barbarian Europe begins. It would lead to a new Christian civilization with many vicissitudes. The Holy Spirit, the evangelizer who has been sent by Christ from the Father, is constantly at work. This same mighty all Holy Spirit of the Father and of the Son has been given to each of us who are baptized into the family of the church. He is God's gift to the church and to each of us, and he testifies in our hearts to the truth and to the person of Jesus. He leads us to believe in him and to place all our hope in him. He inspires us to love and to follow Christ and to bear witness to him before the world of our everyday life. Let us then not make the Holy Spirit sad, as St. Paul warns us against, but ask for his help all our days. He is our counsellor and our sanctifier. He will help us to be faithful to the end. 